So welcome everyone this evening. Thank you for joining. Um, the training tonight is for current and interested members for the local river subcommittees of the Connecticut River Joint Commissions. I'm gonna kick us off this evening with a bit of an introduction and we'll also have Tracy and Marie join us momentarily as well as a few current members sharing their experience. You can ask questions in the chat throughout. This is an open discussion. We can pause throughout. We have plenty of time. I also um, would ask if everyone could please take a moment to put in the chat who you are, if you are a member of a subcommittee where you're zooming in from, um, state, municipality, uh, if you're part of a conservation commission or another organization you feel like might be interesting to folks, but it'd be nice to see who's here. So as I said, you'll also, you'll hear from myself. I should introduce myself. My name is Olivia Rizé. I am one of the staff members for the Connecticut River Joint Commissions. I also work with the Upper Valley Lake Senate Regional Planning Commission. And tonight you'll also hear from Tracy Sales with the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services and Marie Caduto with the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation about both states' um, incentives, interests, uh, feelings of role for the Connecticut River Joint Commissions and the local river subcommittees for each state. You'll also hear from Kathy Erfer, Bill Malcolm, and Tom Karen about their experiences, perspectives about their time as members on the subcommittees. So this introduction is going to be a bit of background, a bit of detail, so bear with me. Um, I think it's really interesting though, it's an exciting organization. The mission established in the bylaws. Right, I have I have things covering my screen, um, but the CRJC mission is to preserve and protect the visual and ecological integrity and sustainable working landscape of the Connecticut River Valley, and to guide its growth and development through grassroots leadership. There is enabling legislation for the organization by both states, Vermont and New Hampshire. These are just brief snippets and they're really similar, um, but I think the language is really um, kind of insightful and um, kind of expresses the breadth and the importance of the CRJC. So I'm gonna, I will take a moment to read both of these snippets. So from Vermont, they see it as a common effort between Vermont and New Hampshire to ensure that development within the Connecticut River watershed proceeds in ways that protect its outstanding ecological, scenic, recreational, historic, cultural, agricultural, fish, and wildlife values. And from New Hampshire, to cooperate between New Hampshire and Vermont in protecting and preserving the visual, ecological, and agricultural integrity of the Connecticut River Valley while planning for and guiding the development of the recreational, tourist, commercial, and residential uses of the valley. So the structure of the Connecticut River Joint Commissions, um, the, but the legislative bodies established the Joint Commission. So there are two Connecticut River Valley Resource Commission in New Hampshire and the Connecticut River Watershed Advisory Commission in Vermont. And together those make up the joint commissions. Both of those commissions have commissioners designated by the governors and designated stakeholders in each state. The watershed, or I should say the upper Connecticut River watershed above the Massachusetts border within New Hampshire and Vermont is then split up into five subcommittee regions. This is required to have at least five um, within the statute. And so starting in the South, we have one Tosticate, then Mount Escutney, Upper Valley, River Bend, and farthest in the North, Headwaters. These committees are made up of 
representatives from each of the riverfront municipalities within their subcommittee region. And you can have up to two members um, and then you can also have alternates as well. And all of these committees are open to the public. All of the meetings are publicly noticed and are now they are all available both in person and online. So you can join either way, although there are quorum requirements for the in-person that we have to meet to be able to conduct um, certain business. The, there is a hybrid option for members of the public and members up to a certain point. I'm going to take a moment to go to go through commissioner and local river subcommittee member responsibilities. It's a little bit detailed, so bear with me, but I think it's really interesting to understand the roles and the ex expansive and interesting purview of, of both memberships. So for commissioners, um, it includes assessing and monitoring the Connecticut River and its watershed for water quality, river flow, flora and fauna, eco and ecological problems of the river and its watershed. So although, I just want to point out here, so although the, the, some permits have restrictions to certain parts of the watershed, um, the purview of the organization itself is the watershed within Vermont and New Hampshire. In addition, advising US, New Hampshire and Vermont legislators and environmental service and economic development agencies, establishing and communicating best river and watershed management practices, educating the public, developing and monitoring relationships with governmental and non-governmental organizations, searching for financial support for operation of CRJC. Both states contribute funding to the CRJC. In addition, there's uh, fundraising and grants in addition to that. Addressing appropriate economic development and hydroelectric issues. And finally, recruiting and developing a strong paid staff and consulting. That's quite a lot. For the local river subcommittee members, to act as a person a contact person for your town officials on river related issues to help your town put the Connecticut River Management Plan into action. I should say here that there are now three management plans um, that the CRJC has um, put forward. The Connecticut River Corridor, recreate, a recreation plan, and a water quality, water resources plan. And I'll show you in a little bit to make sure everyone knows where to find those. In addition, provide advice about permit applications for projects that could affect the river, including site visits that may occur outside of normal meeting times. Provide guidance to Vermont Basin planners for basin plan content and priorities. You'll hear about both of these last two things from Tracy and Marie especially. Advise the CRJC meaning the commissioners in this point, on issues of concern to you or your town, such as water quality problems or Main Street revitalization. Shape the work being done for our valley by federal and state agencies and contribute to the meeting agenda, agenda on specific matters of discussion, discussion, concern, or acknowledgement. So all of you have um, all members and as well as members of the public there is contact information. Um, we'll review that later, but um, you can always contribute items to your local river subcommittee meeting agenda. So a quick touch on some resources I wanna make sure everybody is aware of. The CRJC website is a requirement through our contracts with the states. And it does include quite a bit of information um, here you can see the main kind of the main page as well as the menu. Um, and here you can see the drop down that shows links to the three management plans. And if you haven't seen these, I want to point out that they include both a river wide uh, um, from Vermont and New Hampshire plan as well as sections for each of the subcommittee regions. So if you want to zoom into 
say Vernon, then you want you might want to go to the one toss ticket section of the plan. Um, also the local river subcommittee uh, menu tab, you can get to all of um, the individual subcommittee regions. You can see which municipalities are part of each of those regions. Um, and you can see members including as well as past minutes. And so you can really see a history and kind of current makeup of the sub each subcommittee as well as some general information about the local river subcommittees. Uh, the calendar and special projects have um, a tab for events such as this, part of our speaker series, as well as um, a water quality monitoring program and other special projects that might be happening. The library has um, menu includes an array of different information, including the FERC relicensing, um, comment letters that have been previously submitted, as well as links and resources to partner websites, how to sign up for updates, um, as well as um, resources from the Connecticut River Conservancy. Uh, if you're looking for information about the commissioners, that's under your about CRJC. There is a history there, as well as the bylaws for the organization. If you're ever wondering when your next meeting is, um, that is generally kept up to date in our calendar. And you can see a link to that. Um, we'll be there on the website. You can always email staff, of course. And there's, I would encourage everyone to sign up for the e-newsletter if you aren't already. That comes out only every other month. So it's, it's not very email heavy, um, but we try to communicate events, uh, relevant Connecticut River information, fun, wildlife, uh, interesting, uh, information, hopefully, to all of you. And Aaron, yes, you can find that watershed map on the CRJC website. And if you can't find anything, you can always email myself or Majestic, or there's also the standard email info at crjc.org um, if you need to find something. Also for current members, and this is also linked to on the calendar in each of the subcommittee, um, your upcoming meeting calendar page, there's a link to a cloud storage. I call it a cloud storage, or a, it's actually Google Drive. Um, and so that is for your active meeting materials. So if, if you have a, a permit we have information on, or there is, um, a document that we're reviewing, a plan that is being reviewed from the basin plan, any sort of information like that, that will be in this folder. That's where you can find all of your active meeting documents, like including the agenda as well. There might also be general information, uh, a recruitment flyer. If you get to know someone who might be interested to join, there's some general information there. There's also a permit and project tracking document that provides you links to websites and resources in both New Hampshire and Vermont on permits and projects. So that's a great one-stop shop if you're looking for information or um, of some sort from the states. I wanna take a moment um, to talk briefly about some of the special projects that the Connecticut River Joint Commissions is participating in. The first is the water quality monitoring program that has participation from all five subcommittee regions at this point um, in its most recent iteration um, because there has been water quality monitoring done many years ago, but in this program, um, it was kickstarted by subcommittee members, particularly in the Wontosticket region and then was able to expand um, across the watershed, the Upper Connecticut River watershed, which is really exciting. And so both states provide volunteer programs. And so we participate in both of those programs. One does lab sampling, one is in field testing. And so you can see those um, on the map, the, the point, the tr red triangles are those where we're part of the Vermont La Rosa program and the orange, um, squares are where we are part of the Vermont, uh, the New Hampshire Volunteer River Assessment Program, which is in field testing. 
So we'll be uh, working on that again this season. You don't have to be active in meetings to participate. There are a number of folks who participate with us who are not active in meetings, which is really a, just a wonderful opportunity to connect with engaged members of the community as well. Related because nitrogen is one of the items collected is that we are part of um, two grants with the Long Island Sound Futures Fund, which is a fund to help reduce nitrogen pollution in the Connecticut River and thus the Long Island Sound. And so there are grants now both in agricultural reductions and stormwater reductions and CRJC is participating in that and there's opportunity and will continue to be opportunity for subcommittee members to engage with that program and with their local community to advance those project goals. So that's just something to be aware of moving forward. Um, sometimes we have opportunities through partners to get involved and um, use kind of the, those local connections to expand the work being done. Something we've been doing for a couple of years is a, a riverwide speaker series. Um, we wanted, there were many issues that came up that were of cross interest across the subcommittees. And so instead of having a speaker come to multiple subcommittees, we started this riverwide speaker series. Um, and there's a history of this on, it's in that special project list. And also on our YouTube page, you can see past topics um, but this year, in three weeks, we have one coming up about nitrogen pollution in the Connecticut River. So if you're you're interested in that topic or you know potentially support uh, engaging in that outreach or the agriculture or stormwater initiatives, um, that might be a really good one to listen in on. You'll get to hear both about the regulatory work, modeling work, as well as um, the restoration work being done. So quite a breadth of information from partners there. In addition, we'll have a focus on floodplain management and the Connecticut River. And again, we'll hear both on the regulatory side and the implementation side on what's being done for floodplain management. So that, that'll be in March 12th. The commissioners um, especially have been working on bi-state discussions and that's bringing the states together on a specific topic to move forward actions that have meaningful impact to the Connecticut River Valley and its watershed. So two that are in the works right now are one on April 15th on the farm bill in the Connecticut River watershed. And the second is going to be a speaker and interactive workshop on land use and resilience that will be hosted in Lebanon, um, New Hampshire that'll likely be on May 22nd. And just again, to reiterate that you can reach out to Majestic. Majestic Terhun works with the Wontosuke, Mount and Upper Valley subcommittees. And myself, I work with the Riverbend Headwaters committees and the commissioners. So you can contact us anytime. So with that, I'm going to pass it off first to Tracy Sales to talk to us about the New Hampshire perspective on the Connecticut River Joint Commissions. All right. Thank you, Olivia. I'm going to try to share my screen and see how this works. And start. Maybe. There we go. Uh, can you all see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Um, I've just realized that I don't have my notes here, so I'm going to be doing this off the cuff. Um, so thank you. I am uh, Tracy Sills. I am the Rivers and Lakes Programs Administrator at the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. Um, and Olivia asked me to put together a presentation about uh, permits in New Hampshire and, and how they work for advisory committees. Um, and uh, I started putting the presentation together and I said, um, oh, I have like an hour's worth of 
uh, material here, minimum. Um, so please, Olivia, get out your shepherd's hook and feel free to pull me off the stage when it's time. Um, I will I will give you that ability to do that. Um, but thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully um, you guys have some, get something out of this. Um, like Olivia, um, I'm starting a little bit in the in the background with where the New Hampshire Rivers Management and Protection Program came from, um, just to provide some perspective on why these permits matter um, and why the permits comments from you all are important. Uh, next. <laughs> there we go. Um, so in the mid 1980s, um, a group called the New Hampshire Rivers Campaign got together um, and were trying to figure out why or how to, to deal with the competing uses on the rivers in New Hampshire. Um, I skipped one. Yep, competing uses, skipped one. Um, so they were concerned about um, there was a lot of argument on sort of how to use our rivers, what was best. And, you know, as you can imagine, there are people who want to dam the rivers for hydropower, but there's people that want to paddle on them. There's um, people who want to, you know, have open space for to protect the ecology, um, but there's also people who want to build, you know, towns and homes and all that. Um, and then there's the water quality concerns relative to both. Um, similarly, there's people that want to take water out of the river for, you know, drinking water and agricultural use, um, but then we also need to have water in our rivers for fish. So um, in 1988, the New Hampshire legislature created the Rivers Management Protection Program with the idea of bringing together um, towns, locals, um, and the state to work together to um, better, um, you know, to, to better manage the river, um, to figure out, you know, what are, what are the best options? Um, so, <laughs> and again, this is where I need my notes. Um, I don't know where they went. Um, so, uh, in this case, um, the, the purpose of the program is really to bring together um, local towns, um, get towns working together, get towns working together with the state. And then in the unique case of CRJC, um, getting the states to work together. And, and Olivia, I was really happy to hear that um, that was a major part of um, the commissioner's uh, scope of uh, duties. So, um, but what also comes out of, of this work is the advisory committees um, in, and that includes both CRJC in this case and the subcommittees. Um, and you guys are the, the ones who are doing this. It's not, it's not us at the state, it's not the folks in the town that are um, nominating you guys, it, it is you guys. Um, and it's it's about the work that you do. Um, at this point in New Hampshire, um, there are now 19 um, designated rivers and river segments. Um, there are 1,010 miles of designated rivers um, in New Hampshire and the Connecticut River is entirely um, part of New Hampshire. Um, there are 130 riverfront communities, unincorporated places and state parks, and that would be all of the towns um, and areas in gray on the map. And uh, specific to you guys, the Connecticut River was designated in 1992, um, and it was the eighth river designated into the program. As I said before, um, it is really you guys who are doing the work. Um, you're the you're really the key here. Um, and in statute in New Hampshire, um, as Olivia was listing for CR, for your CRJC, there are duties um, 
applied to both CRJC and its subcommittees. Um, these are shortened uh, for the most part, um, but basically you get to tell us, uh, New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, the statewide uh, Rivers Management Advisory Committee and the municipalities, what you think should be done to better uh, protect the river. Um, you also can tell us what to do with state-owned lands that are being proposed for sale. Um, you are um, asked to comment on federal and state um, permits. Um, you are asked to, as Olivia was pointing out, develop um, river corridor management plans and assist on in its local adoption. And you're asked to report back to the Rivers Management Advisory Committee again and DES um, and annually to the municipalities um, on the status of uh, federal compliance, um, state law, state compliance, local ordinances, um, and and how those um, are being are, are they successfully um, apply, being applied to your plan? So the focus of this discussion is really about the second piece, um, and this is the actual statutory language to consider and comment on any state, federal, state, or local governmental plans to approve, license, fund, or construct facilities or applications for permits, certificates, or licenses that may alter the resource values and characteristics for which the river seg or segment is designated. Just run on sentence, but, um, and so I wanna, I wanna really point out, this is really the, you know, one of the major keys in uh, achieving the goals that Olivia was mentioning at the very beginning, um, the purpose of allowing development while also protecting the river and its watershed is finding ways to, you know, allow, a, you know, a house to be built on the shore of the river, um, but done in a way that is not gonna damage the river. And that's where you guys come in. So what I'm gonna go on to do is um, kind of talk about the various types of permits and then um, a little bit of details on some of the additional ones. So in New Hampshire, there are a bunch of <laughs> permits, permit types that you guys will see. Um, wetlands permits or dredge and fill, they're also called. Shoreland permits, which are um, for basically disturbing the land within 250 feet of your of the river. Um, alteration of terrain, which is basically digging up a lot of ground. Um, and I'll talk about those. Those are the three most common um, that are likely to impact a river. And so the ones that you're gonna see the most often, and I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on those. But some of the other ones that you may see um, from time to time are uh, solid waste. And we've got a big one going on on the river right now um, in Dalton, um, not gonna say more. Um, hazardous wastewater uh, permits. And these are um, permits by generally um, industries who are um, producing wastewater in their processes that has to be um, treated specially before it can even go to the wastewater treatment facility. Um, so they have to have a permit for that. You have an opportunity to comment on those. Um, above ground and underground storage tanks, um, those also require permits. So, you know, the most common example there is going to be your typical gas station. Um, dams and is another one that we see occasionally. Um, and this is usually for either major repairs or, um, Installing it and you know, putting in a new dam, we don't see that too often. So most of the uh, permit applications you guys are gonna see are gonna come from DES, but we do occasionally see um, some from other agencies in the state. And the most common one there um, are from the Department of Agriculture, Markets and Food, and they are the pesticide and herbicide um, application permits. Um, so we see those a lot for treatment of uh, invasive species along the river's um, edge. 
So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about um, the state wetland permits. Um, this is a really complicated <laughs> Venn diagram that I pulled out. There are a bunch of different kinds of wetland permits. Um, and some of them you guys review and some of them you don't. Um, for those of you who can see it, um, there's a green circle in the middle that um, incorporates the ones the, that the local subcommittees are invited to review. Um, so what per, permit application types in for wetlands that you are uh, requested to review are the standard permit applications, which are um, your standard, standard dredge and fill. Then there's expedited permit applications. These are for slightly smaller projects um, and they have a shorter turnaround time. And for both of these permit types, they should be sent to you guys before they even get sent to DES. Um, and hopefully you guys get to sign off on those uh, before, um, before they come. So hopefully they meet your requirements um, even before they're sent to DES. If they don't, either you don't like them or they don't, um, and so, so therefore you don't sign them because you don't like them, um, or they haven't sent them to you, um, there is an opportunity to um, submit comments after, after they've come to DES as well. Um, the other types of um, permit applications that you are invited to review are smaller projects, um, and these are all um, stream crossing projects. They can be submitted on a number of different kinds of forms. They can be, actually, they can be on an expedited permit. They can be in statutory permit permits by notification. They can be in lower scrutiny approvals. I don't know where the names came from, but um, again, wetland permits by notification or routine roadway registrations. Um, but all of them would be um, those, and I actually have more information about that here. Um, all of them would be those that are in um, LAC jurisdiction. So LACs would be your uh, New Hampshire only counterparts um, in the Rivers Management Protection Program. So um, LAC jurisdiction, and I, you know, this is the, the simple, the short definition, but for, yes, okay, backing up. For standard and um, expedited um, permit applications, it's gonna be any project within the quarter mile river corridor. For stream crossing projects, um, it is, LAC jurisdiction is within 250 feet of a designated river um, on a water body that is hydrologically connected to the designated river, which also includes the designated river, and uh, passing a stream that draining at least 200 acres. So that means that um, they really don't want you to be reviewing things that are like a dry, uh, driveway drainage, like stormwater drainage um, culvert, that sort of thing. Um, because I figured those projects are too small um, to be really particularly important. Um, the subcommittees also do not comment on emergency authorizations. Um, we've had some of those lately. <laughs> um, but um, should, an, should the work conducted under an emergency authorization require a regular uh, state wetlands permit, then you would have an opportunity to comment at that point. Um, and then other um, projects that you would not comment on are those normally, um, with the exception of those stream crossing projects, um, submitted on per permits by notification, statutory permits by notification, and routine roadway maintenance registrations. Um, just as a quick, um, 
answer. Comment deadlines for standard dredge and fills, if they haven't been sent to you before they were sent to DES, is normally 40 days. Um, expedited dredge and fills would actually be the same if they were not sent to you ahead of time. Um, and then the, um, the stream crossings all have to be sent to you ahead of time, otherwise they are incomplete. So moving on to shoreland and alteration of terrain uh, permit applications. Um, shoreland permits, there are two types of shoreland permits. Um, there's a standard shoreland permit these are used for excavation, fill, or construction activities within 250 feet of a river. Um, and that would be, or lake, large lake. And that only applies to larger rivers that are fourth order or higher, or designated. Um, comment periods on shoreland permits are 25 days for our advisory committees. Um, and that is because DES is required to um, approve or deny a shoreland permit within 30 days of receipt by DES. So unfortunately, the turnaround times are really short. Um, there is also a shoreland permit by notification. That is for smaller projects within the 250 foot um, shoreland zone. Um, and these are for projects that impact less than 1500 square feet um, for during construction, but with a net increase of uh, in impervious surface, uh, less than 900 square feet. Um, these do not have a comment period for advisory committees because um, NHDES only has five days, five business days to review these applications when they come in. So the turnaround time would be uh, next to impossible. Uh, moving on, we have alteration of terrain. Uh, permit applications, which we see a fair number of them as well. Alteration of terrain um, applications are um, required for any project disturbing more than 100,000 square feet of land or anywhere um, in the state of New Hampshire, um, or if they are disturbing more than 500 square feet of land uh, within the protected shoreline. And that includes like, a, for example, a six, uh, 60,000 square foot project with 10 square feet in the protected shoreland, then they would still have to do a alteration of terrain. So it can be any amount of land um, in that 250 feet uh, from the river. Um, alteration of terrain um, comment period is 40 days. Um, and again, that is because um, DES has 50 days uh, to comment. And so we unfortunately have to make your comment periods a little bit shorter um, so that we have time to um, make sure that we've considered your comments um, in the final permit that's put together. If you were ever um, in a position of, you know, our 25 day comment period ends on Tuesday and we're meeting on Wednesday, um, I really encourage you to reach out to the permit reviewer for that particular permit. And if you don't know who that is, I can help you with that. Um, and contact the permit reviewer to let them know that that's when you're meeting and you're gonna get the uh, comments to them the next day. And um, the folks that are usually really helpful and are happy to um, hold their um, final permit reviews until they've received your comments. Um, you guys also have the opportunity to review federal permits. Um, and I think Olivia mentioned that as well, which is really cool. The two most common ones um, that we see in our program are the one from EPA, um, and that is NIPTES permits or National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System uh, permits. And those are typically um, discharge permits from, for example, wastewater treatment facilities. There are some other um, folks that require NIPTES permits as well. Um, but that would be one of the more common ones. And then one that I know you're all intimately familiar with, <laughs> um, which are hydropower dam relicenses that are um, issued by the Federal Energy Resource Commission or FERC. Um, so I know you're highly familiar with those. 
Um, but occasionally there are odds and ends of other ones that will come up as well. And finally, um, in addition to sort of regular permits, there are other opportunities uh, for comments uh, to things happening in New Hampshire. Um, one of them is funding, and that was one of the things in that section B of the statute that I was reading off earlier. Um, if somebody is applying for funds through um, a state program, you guys have the opportunity to um, submit your comments either in support or against of a particular uh, operation. Um, so state revolving funds is one of them. Um, and we can go into more about what a state revolving fund is. That's typically a loan. Sometimes that includes some grant um, funding as well um, for oftentimes municipal projects or um, it, large, um, you know, pr larger private projects. Um, and then aquatic resource mitigation fund um, grants. And the ARM fund is um, basically a, a bank of money that is collected from people doing projects in New Hampshire who um, are impacting wetlands, but do not have the resources on site in order to be able to, um, to mitigate those wetland impacts on site. Um, so what they do is they pay into the fund. When the fund has collected a sufficient amount of money, um, staff at DES in that program will issue a request for proposals and ask for projects that will um, protect wetlands. And there's a lot of different ways that can be done um, that qualify. And then, but that those projects have to be in the watershed where the impact was initially um, made. So that is another place where you guys can um, comment, support um, a project. Uh, next, land disposal. Um, you guys have a really sort of unique ability to suggest whether or not a particular um, piece of land that is being proposed for sale in New Hampshire that's owned by the state should be sold or not. Um, and so whenever we come across those, we forward them on to you guys and say, hey, what do you guys think? Um, and typically you're not going to see, you know, a big state park or something like that, um, be disposed, but a lot of times you get, you know, little odds and ends of leftover, um, land from DOT, for example, that was purchased as part of, you know, building a new road that they don't need anymore. And, um, somebody next door says, eh, I want that piece of property. Um, can I buy it? Well, that's fine if it's not being used for anything else. But a lot of times you find that those little snippets of state-owned land are actually really useful um, informal river access for fishing, kayaking, you know, whatever. Um, and we want to make sure those are retained in state ownership. So you guys have the opportunity to um, put in your two cents on that. And then finally, the last one I'm gonna talk about is um, 401 water quality certifications. Um, Section 401 is, is from the Clean Water Act, um, but um, in the state of New Hampshire, if you are doing a project, you know, a big project, and that includes um, <laughs> the dam, uh, hydropower dam relicensing, um, you have to ensure that you're not gonna impact water quality. Um, so this is also something that uh, advisory committees can comment on. So a lot of times I get questions about, well, are the are the comments that we submit actually- Tracy, just you know, uh, one more minute. Okay, thank you. But the hook has been unthreatened. Um, actually doing good. Um, but I get a lot of questions from folks saying, you know, do the comments that we submit um, actually make a difference? Um, you know, how do I, you know, I'm not an engineer. How do I know what I should be commenting on? Um, 
And I, I want to reassure you that your comments are listened to and they are really important to us. Um, even if you're not an engineer, which is fine, most of us aren't, um, you guys know your river locally. Um, you know what's been going on. You may know that there's another project upstream or downstream that the permit reviewer at DES doesn't know about. Um, and while each project individually is um, relatively minor, the two projects together might be a little bit too much uh, for the river at that point to handle. So that is really important for us to know. Similarly, you know may know about um, nearby protected species or habitats that the New Hampshire um, Natural Heritage Bureau isn't aware of. Um, and so if there's something there that is not showing up on the NHB um, list, then yeah, please let us know. Topography is another one. Um, most of our permit applications um, are not ground checked by DES staff. So if there's, for example, steep slopes that are not being indicated on the um, project plans, we really need to know that because that can totally change what's allowed in a particular project. And finally, um, as Olivia was mentioned, um, you guys know what the water quality is. Um, you guys are all out there collecting water quality in the Connecticut River. Um, maybe you know that this particular location has been having a real problem with one particular thing and we need to take extra uh, precautions on a development that's happening. Also, um, and again, uniquely to you, um, DES is not likely to know what's going on in Vermont. Um, so that bi-state information is really important. Um, you guys also have the opportunity to ask for things that DES can't. So DES is restricted by the, we have the advantage of the laws, but we're also restricted by our laws. And advisory committees can ask for things like, um, ero you know, wildlife friendly erosion control netting, um, green snow pro, um, snow removal um, contractors um, that are beyond the scope of what DES permit reviewers can actually require by our, through our laws. And sometimes those things actually become part of the law, like the wildlife friendly er erosion control blankets. Um, so, and then last but not least, um, if you guys know what was permitted, you can also keep an eye out and let us know if you see something that is not in the permit and uh, reach out to us and let us know so that we can make sure that uh, that project is being brought back into compliance. Oops, next. And that's all I got. Um, so thank you for having me and I'm happy to answer questions whenever questions are allowed. I'm not sure when they're allowed. So, and you can reach me at the email or phone that's here. Thanks, Tracy. I think this is a good time to read um, the qu quote I have. Tom Karen with the Headwaters Subcommittee wasn't able to join us this evening, um, but he did send me one of the items to share about his experience. And so I'm just gonna read that. And if folks want to put in any questions in the chat for Tracy, we can get to those. Um, also, if there's anything that warrants um, that can't be answered in the chat, we'll bring that to the full group and, and have that as part of our discussion. Um, but I'll read this from Tom Karen. He says, there's strength in numbers when we cannot, when we comment as committees on issues that affect the towns within the scope of the CRJC. While most issues that we have to comment on are specific to the areas of the local committees, Sometimes there are topics that concern the entire region. That was the case when we universally opposed the Northern Pass project that threatened to fundamentally change the character of the places that we live, where we live and visitors recreate. Reflecting the opinions of the towns we represent, all of the local river subcommittees joined the Headwaters Committee in voicing our concerns and opposition to Northern Pass. We were one of many individuals, communities, and organizations that opposed the project, but I like to think that our unity on the issue helped the CRJC 
be a prominent voice concerning, concerning its potential impact. Not all that we do is commenting on issues or permits, however. Sometimes it can be drawing attention to a public safety concern that affects a large area and many people in Northern New Hampshire and Vermont. Recently, I was asked to write a letter of inquiry from our headwater subcommittee to check the status of the emergency action plan for one of our local dams. It turned out that the plan, which is supposed to be revised every couple of years, had gone quiet some time without a revision. After some research of my own and speaking with local contacts on the issue, we submitted our letter and were assured by the New Hampshire Dam Bureau that our concerns would be addressed promptly. The quick and thorough response from the state agencies involved confirmed that the CRJC does important work in protecting our most important research, resource, the Connecticut River, as well as the communities that call it home. So thank you, Tom, for sending that, that in. And at this point, I'm going to pass it off to Marie Caduta with the state of Vermont. Oh, this. I'm making the assumption that you can see that. Great, thanks. So I'm Marie Levette Caduto. I'm one of five watershed planners in Vermont. And so what I'm going to do is just talk for a bit about what basin planning is all about and how we go about doing it. Um, as I said, they, we there are five basin planners. We all cover specific areas of Vermont, and when we call, we use the term basin to cover what anything from one specific river, like the White River, or a group of rivers, the West William Saxtons. Um, those nine through sixteen there are all Connecticut River basin watersheds. I cover ten, eleven, and twelve. Um, Keith Fritzy, who is uh, the newest one of our, our planners, covers the White River and the Stevens Wells Waits on Pompanoosic. And then Ben Copans covers the northern two uh, basins, the Pasumpsic and the Upper Connecticut River Direct. So when we when we do these basin plans, we're trying to answer a bunch of questions um, and find out what's going on in the watershed. So we're looking at what are the water quality and the aquatic habitat conditions at this point? What are we finding from our monitoring? If those conditions need improvement, where do we need to do that? If the conditions are great and we want to make sure we protect that good water quality, we need to figure out where that needs to happen. We need to hear from the public from you folks, what you want to use the waters for. There are designated uses of fishing, swimming, boating, irrigation, those kind of things. But what are our goals for our rivers? We classify rivers by their quality and by the uses we want to make of them. Um, and so those are what we call our management goals. How do we go about doing that? What are the strategies? What are the actions we need to put in place to make those improvements or to do that protection. And who wants to play? Um, basically, who are our partners out there who are, are willing to work with us on implementing projects and where we need to find the money to, to make those projects happen on the ground? So those are the things we're trying to cover. And we do it across the state in a five-year cycle which starts with the biologists and, and assessment folks going out and doing the water quality monitoring, doing the geophysical monitoring. Then we take that data and it goes through an assessment process to figure out, to summarize it, figure out what it means. And then the planners step in and whoop, go back a minute. And we start drafting the plan and, and that's a very public process. There's a lot of back and forth. We do that, we finally get the, plan through the process and start implementing those watershed projects. And then we circle back around and do an evaluation. How do we do? What do we still have to do? And then we start it all over again. 
when we're doing the monitoring, we're looking at physical, chemical, and biological monitoring. And we do that on our rivers, lakes, streams, ponds, and our wetlands. So there are, there are scientists that are going out and covering all these areas. And we gather all that data and make it publicly accessible. So all of the, the data that I'm about to show you is all on our website. And you can access this, you can access the specific data, the raw data, and, and see what's been monitored and what we're finding out. Uh, so this is an example of a river monitoring site and we're monitoring macroinvertebrate populations, we're monitoring fish communities, and we're, and we're doing the, the water quality monitoring as well for, for chemistry. We're using this data to identify where we know there are pollution sources or where we're concerned that the water quality is not meeting water quality standards. We're looking for those high quality waters that we should be protecting to maintain that good water quality. And we, through the basin plans, we have to address um, any waters that are impaired or aren't meeting Vermont water quality standards. We do similar monitoring for our lakes and ponds, and we're looking at that through you know, the water quality. We're looking at the shoreland and the lake habitat conditions. We're looking at the presence or absence of invasive species. And you can see that pretty much every single uh, secchi disc on this is yellow on the atmospheric and mercury deposition end of things, um, which is what we, we get through basically acid rain um, getting dumped on, on from northern New England. Um, so that's getting better over time, but it's still out there. And more recently, we're doing wetland assessment as well. And this is, <clears throat> this is a scale that's not, not the same as the others. The river and lakes monitoring are kind of all over random sampling. These are very specific. We've the it's only been going on for five or six years. So the ones that have been monitored are the ones we ask the teams to monitor. And that means they're either we think something's going bad and we want them to take a look at it so we can figure out how to fix it, or we think they're really good and we want a, a documentation for protection. So this isn't a random sampling, but it does give you a sense of of where we are on that scale of red, which is not so good, to green, which is good um, throughout our, our wetlands. This happens to be the, the Black Ottaquiche Basin. And as I mentioned, we classify our waters and, and that provides levels of protection. Most of the waters in Vermont are B at B2s at this point. And we are now going through the process. We've created B1 and we've had A1. So A1 waters are our most nat cleanest, most natural condition waters. A lot of our headwater streams, things like that. And we do this by, by the use we want that water to attain. So aquatic biota, aquatic habitat, fishing, swimming, boating, those are all the uses we make of our waters. And, and when they meet those natural conditions, excellent water quality, we want them to stay there. So we wanna give a level of protection by classifying those as A1s. And we're doing the same for B1s and B2s as we go forward. And yet there are lots, still plenty of impaired waters or waters that aren't meeting our water quality standards. And the plans are required to address those waters. Um, so inventorying, assessing, developing strategies, and then implementing um, actions that are going to improve those water qualities are, are a big part of the basin planning. We do that by addressing land use sectors as we, we term them. So those are agriculture, developed lands, stormwater roads, um, wastewater treatment, and natural resource restoration. So our job is to look at all those land uses, identify projects that, that can be implemented to improve water quality and aquatic habitat conditions, find partners to work with and willing landowners and, and that, that really is the key. None of the projects that we have identified 
are regulatory and required to be put in by anyone. This is all voluntary. So the projects that we do, we need cooperating landowners, we cooperating municipalities, and cooperating partners to help us do the work. Um, a good part of my job is to find funding and match that funding to projects that we want done, um, getting those projects designed and implemented on the ground. We do all kinds of restoration projects, everything from buffer plantings and wetland restorations to stormwater projects to removing the large fuel tanks from the Connecticut River, <laughs> road, bridge projects, ag projects, all kinds of things. Um, so it, it's a wide range and, and we're always looking for, for good projects to do on the landscape. And that's, that's a lot of what we come to you for. Just to give you a few examples of things that we have done, this is a, an underground stormwater treatment practice at the Springfield Transfer Station, which was running off into one storm drain that dumped directly into the Black River. So now all that, that runoff gets treated before it enters the Black River. Connecticut River Conservancy led this project, which was a, a private dam that had failed on in someone's backyard. And just downstream from that was a large constricted perched dry road culvert. Um, so they took it on and, and removed the dam, restored the stream channel, replaced, pulled the culvert and replaced it with a properly sized bridge. Um, so the flow in that stream is, is much more natural and the habitat condi conditions are improved. Um, this is a great example that kicked off after Tropical Storm Irene in Brattleboro where a, a, a elderly housing facility was flooded and regularly flooded. Um, that's what it looked like after Irene on the left. And through a lot of different processes, not necessarily run by Tactical Basin, but kicked off by it early on. Um, the housing development was mostly removed. The buildings were removed, the stream, the floodplain was restored. And this is a picture after the July floods that Kathy Erfer, who was on this, this training, um, took of the floodplain functioning as a floodplain is supposed to function, allowing the water to spread out, slow down, um, and use the floodplain. So floodplain restoration projects right now are, are of great interest to a lot of people. So this was a small dam behind the West Windsor fire station that collapsed every time a good rain came, but they needed it to feed the fire trucks. And to do that, to maintain that water level for them to draw from, we removed the dam, we installed a series of stone weirs that gradually drop down to, so the water level at the top is still deep enough. And in that July flood, the entire channel of Millbrook was available for flow. And so it didn't cause damage or blockage or ruin the dam on its way through. And just upstream from that was another breach dam that doesn't look like too much, but it constricted flow enough that in Irene, it took out a historic barn, took out 200 feet of road. We didn't need to remove the whole dam. We just took down the top of it to again, allow those high waters to use the entire stream channel. And in the July floods, there was no damage done. So we do, we identify these projects in all the different land use sectors. This is just a short list of, of the Basin 10 plan that I completed some months ago. So we look at agricultural projects. We look at stormwater and roads and wastewater and the natural resources, finding river, lakes, wetlands, forest projects that, that might be implemented. And now we're also including climate change adaptation and social equity actions that will address those issues in our watershed plans as well. 
All of the projects are ident that have been identified are in what we call the Watershed Projects Database. And again, this is all available online. Statewide, there are over 11,000 projects listed in this database. Again, every, every different type of project. Um, so you go, you can go into the database and put in the basin that you happen to be interested in, or you can put in your own town and it will bring up all the projects. And, you know, there's myriads of them. And the, the thing that we would love you to do is this is another format of the same information called the, the Clean Water Project Explorer, which is an interactive map um, that you can zoom in and out of, but each one of these buttons is a separate project. And if you click on the button, it will tell you what that project is. And you can zoom into it. You can find out exactly where on the landscape it is. You can find out if it's on your property and you can see which kind of project it is, if it's ag or natural resources or stormwater. And you know th this is how we work with our partners. Um, when we have grant funding, our partners will, will go through this database, look for projects that they feel like they can take the lead on. And then we work together to, to make sure they're, to find the funding, the right funding source for that project um, and work with our partners to get those projects on the ground. Well, that didn't go. There it is. <clears throat> so throughout this process, what we look to CRJC and local river subcommittees to do for us, and, and also if you're not associated with, with a committee, we definitely are interested in general public input in this process. So we're looking for what, what the needs are out there in the watershed, in the entire watershed. Um, what your concerns are, where you see problems, where you see things that, that just don't look right, and also where you see things that look great. We want to do that protection as well as the restoration end of it. So what projects would you like us to be doing on the landscape in your region and in your town? We run the draft plan by you. We put it out to for comment. Um, the I'm working on the Deerfield, Whetstone Brook down that way right now. And hopefully that's gonna be out um, for public comment over the winter. So, or I should say by now, probably this spring, um, but we'll put it out there and hopefully you'll be able to take a look at that, see what's written about your area, see what projects are identified um, and provide us feedback on that, help us prioritize, you know, there's, 11,000 projects around the state. We need to start somewhere and we need to make the best investments we can with the funding that we have. So what other priorities? Um, where would you like us to do that kind of work? And we need buy-in, right? We need local landowners. We need municip yeah, municipal land owners, towns to participate in the, the restoration and protection as well. So being that, that conduit between the state and your local communities and making that connection will really help get these projects on the ground. And as with New Hampshire, although the, the Vermont side of the commissions doesn't require permit review, we do ask for it. And we do take the local river subcommittees um, comments into consideration and, and in our permit application reviews. So that's a valuable that that's valuable input on the Vermont side of the watershed as well. And that's what I have to tell you. You can find out a lot more on the, the basin planning website, the watershed planning website. So just Google or call up Vermont Watershed Planning Program and you'll get to our webpage and you can certainly contact me um, through email and Olivia and Majestic certainly know how to get a hold of me. <laughs> so I will leave it at that. Thank you, Marie. 
We did have one question I thought you could answer now. Um, Linwood Andrew, oh, sorry, I think your, your question was answered by Tracy. She was asking about why plant data is not included in the monitoring. And Tracy was saying that they're are typically less sensitive, um, but are still important. Um, also, Aaron DeVries asked whether the wetland assessments reports were available on the ANR website. I think they are. That's a very good question. That's still still new. I I will while we're continuing talking, I will make sure they are and, and figure out where. Um, the the river data and the lakes data are just under um, the monitoring program. All our data is publicly available. And when you get into the water database, the water quality database, I know the wetlands are in there. Um, they're not presented like they are in the in the map that I just showed, but the data is in the in the database, and I can provide that link. And as far as as plant data, we do have plant identification data on lakes and ponds. Um, the only data we collect for rivers and streams are macrophytes, basically the mosses and, and algae is coating the rocks in the base of the river. And that's a water quality indicator, um, but we don't do specific plant identification in our rivers and streams. So Kathy, if you, um, I had asked Kathy to share a little bit about her experience working with both the permits and the basin plans and just what her experience as a member has been like. And, and also um, as a, an advocate for, with the Connecticut River Conservancy, uh, some points about the, the dam relicensing that's um, quite act possibly getting going to get quite active um, soon. So go ahead, Kathy. Thank you for, for joining us this evening. We're glad to, thanks. Uh, good evening, everybody. Nice to see all your names and see who's here. Um, when Olivia asked me, one of the one of the things that came to mind, I thought would be a good example for one of the New Hampshire permits that we reviewed on the one task to get subcommittee was um, it was actually the replacement of um, at a gas station, the replacements of the pipes going from the storage tanks to the pumps. And um, one of the things that I sort of realized or that I wanted to share about this particular permit was that we requested a site visit. And I kind of, I feel like that's a really useful thing to do. Uh, in a lot of cases, you know, you may, like when that came in front of us, I think all of us were feeling like none of us has the expertise to know anything about a gas station. But by going and having a site visit, you notice things on site and you can ask questions to the engineer about what they're doing, why they're doing it, um, what are they required to do. And one of the things that we noticed in this particular site visit was that the, there was a storm drain at the far corner of the site um, where any spilled gas, if it were to run off, would end up in that storm drain. And so as a really simple request, our comments were just to retrofit the storm drain to include uh, a piece of equipment that would be able to capture um, oil and gas. And I can share my screen really quick. Oh, Olivia, can you give me? Screen sharing. I believe that should work now. Okay, um, give me one sec, yeah, here. I wanted to just share, you know, so sometimes these engineering plans come in front of you and you think, oh my God, you know, I don't even know what I'm looking at. But by asking for a site visit, it all becomes clear. And so in this case, what we requested after the site visit and realizing that we wanted to just at least have this little retrofit, um, was we asked them to update the plans and share them with us. And so what you see here are um, in the bottom corner, it says existing catch basins to be equipped with snout oil hood or approved you know, equal technology. And then they added the specifications for how this sh should be um, installed. So I just thought this was a good example of something where you, you don't necessarily feel like you 
know what you're walking into, but I think asking for site visits can, like I said, be really helpful in clarifying the situation and then actually being able to provide some more comprehensive comment. Um, the other thing that Olivia asked me to cover a little bit was just the work about the relicensing and and it's we've been reaching out to the towns uh adjacent to the river in vermont and new hampshire in the project area and that's about 30 towns to do presentations some of you i think have seen that presentation um to update everyone and it takes quite a long time to sort of dig into the details of that so it's pretty hard to cover in five minutes but Basically, this has been a almost 12 year process of um, relicensing five hydroelectric facilities on the main stem of the river between the border of Massachusetts all the way up to Piermont. It's about a 175 mile area. And um, the license will be 40 years long. So it literally is a once in a lifetime opportunity to affect uh, what is required in this license of the company in the form of protection for environmental considerations, cultural considerations, and mitigation. And we have um, on our website, we have a whole page dedicated to this. And I will just briefly share a look at that. And then I will stick a link in the chat. And this kind of explains the background about the facilities, where the facilities are, the process of relicensing. So it's, it can function as a little bit of a primer if people are interested in learning more about that. And I think with that, Olivia, before we run out of time, it's probably really useful if people wanna ask questions unless you had something else on the agenda. No, you took the words out of my mouth. That sounds like the perfect segue. Uh, so thank you, Kathy. And at this point we have, um, I have some time left. So if anybody wants to um, raise their hand or you know, you could probably go ahead and unmute or throw a question in the chat, um, feel free to ask a question or even if you have a comment and, and or another experience that you'd like to share, you feel like would be valuable to share with this group um, as well as those who might watch the recording, uh, that would be wonderful. I'll take that question. Lynn would put that in the chat. Um, and Lynn would, as an aside, I just replied to your email. So <laughs> um, we, we don't know exactly when the comment period will be. What we have been waiting for is FERC needs to issue something called the Ready for Environmental Analysis. And then there will be a request for comments after that. They... Um, they, I think, are beginning to do their analysis and they can ask the companies for additional information. And so about um, a month and a half ago or two months ago, they requested additional information. There was a deadline. Both companies provided that information. Literally, the deadline for Great River Hydro was, I think, um, on the 1st or the 31st of January. So that was just completed. So if FERC feels they're satisfied and they have enough all the information they need to evaluate the applications, they could literally issue this REA like next week, or, you know, they may sit on it, need to do more research, maybe ask for more information, and it could be a month or two months from now. So we actually have no idea when this is going to come. When they issue it, it will be a 60-day comment period. Um, and so... That we're trying to, you know, re-engage people and get them thinking about it just because sometimes writing comments can take a long time. I hope there are no other questions. I just want to thank everyone who shared this evening, Tracy, Marie, Tom, and Kathy for joining. Um, I think this is gonna be a really valuable, this has been a very valuable resource and will continue to be 
um, to interested and current members of the Connecticut River Joint Commission. So thank you and have a wonderful evening. Thanks, good night. Good night.